Morning. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Is that good? No. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, good. Wow. Look at this. This is amazing. This is amazing. Uh, so I am uh, Jennifer Gunter. I'm the director of the South Carolina Collaborative for Race and Reconciliation, and I am thrilled that today is here. Um, this is uh, a intergenerational, interdisciplinary, southeastern conversation about equity. Um, and what I really would hope comes out of this is um, to begin to increase the power of the network across the Southeast, where we can begin to have conversations with each other on 
how do we make it better for all of our uh, all of our people in our communities? How can we make our communities stronger, healthier, and safer? And we can only really do that by increasing equity. Um, and I also I think it's wonderful to bring together all these people that really want the same thing, right? Everyone in this room is hoping to make this world a better place. And often, and I've told a couple of you this, uh, you look online and it seems like, you know, it's just full of hate. Like the world is full of hate, but that's not the case. The world is full of, of love and the world is full of hope. And you are proof of that. So um, very excited uh, to welcome Dr. William Pruitt, who uh, actually get to share a beautiful office together. We are um, uh, out of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of South Carolina. And he is the Associate Director of Community Engagement and Service Learning. Um, and he's going to welcome um, our people from Atlanta. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? No, that was not too bad for a Thursday morning, all right. Um, first of all, let us give race, the Race and Reconciliation Project, Dr. Gunter and Kate Schoen, a big round of applause for what they're putting in here. You guys can't hear me? Check, check, mic one, two. I used to want to be a famous rapper in my younger days, so. Um, I am honored to introduce this amazing panel today. Let me say I got their bios and I said, shish, I need to step my game up. So um, I am honored to be here introducing them today. Um, first, we have a Massachusetts, Massachusetts, I can never say that word, native, Allison Van Timber, who has called Atlanta home for the past four years. She recently joined the National Center for Civil and Human Rights as the campaign manager for reconciliation and lynching projects. And as a graduate student, she organized the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative. The Fulton County Remembrance Coalition works to engage Fulton County in a process of truth and reconciliation by confronting our history of racial terrorism and recognizing its legacy. Allison holds a Bachelor of Science in Marketing from Fordham University and a Master of Social Work from Georgia State University. Please give. Um, give me a hand in welcoming Allison Benson. <laughs> the second member of our panel is Dr. Ed Lee III, a senior director of the Alvin W. Barkley Forum for Debate Deliberation and Dialogue, which houses Emory's nationally acclaimed debate team and its cutting edge dialogue programs. As senior director, Ed works directly with the Emory Woodruff Scholars Program to recruit and support high caliber students to the Glenn Pelham Alumni Foundation to maintain purposeful and engaging relationships with Emory alumni. He was the 2015 Ross K. Smith National Coach of the Year and a three-time recipient of the James Unger Award given to the coach of the best debate team in the country. Before coming to Emory, Ed served as the Director of Debate at the University of Alabama and the director of UC Berkeley's Bay Area Urban Debate League. Additionally, Dr. Lee serves as the curriculum director and lead facilitator for the Social Justice Initial In Innovative Institute. He is also the primary contributor to inking a social justice innovative, to linking the social justice innovative blog. Ed is a relentless advocate for public debate and dialogue. He is a national media commentator for the U.S. presidential debates and the use of arguments in public discourse. And he is routinely seen on CNN discussing presidential debate strategies and their impact on national, pro national politics. He has a doctorate degree in higher education management from the University of Georgia's Institute for Higher Education and a master's degree in communication studies from the University of Alabama. And he is currently studying the interconnections between religion, justice, and peace building at Emory's University's Chandler School of Theology. Join Candler. 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 <laughs> thank, thank you, please. Appreciate that. Get me right, please. Please join me in welcoming Ed Lee. And our third panelist today is Ms. Renee Madison. She is the Communications Manager and Public Information Officer for the City of Decatur. She is responsible for the city's newsletter, Decatur Focus, 
the website, social media, and other communication initiatives, including serving as the city's public information officer. She is also one of the staff liaisons to the city's Better Together Advisory Board, which provides an opportunity for residents with interest and expertise in, their, in areas of equity, inclusion, and engagement to assist the city in moving the Better Together Community Action Plan forward. In addition, her regular in addition to her regular communication duties, she is an active member of the DeKalb County Communicators, the Georgia Municipal, Municipal Association, Georgia Communicators Group, City Counties Communications and Marketing Association, and I asked her what this acronym was. I'm going to ask her again because I forgot it. PRSA? Public Relations Society of America. I love acronyms. All right. <laughs> Prior to joining the city of Decatur, Renee has spearheaded public relations campaigns following the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, community outreach and Feed the Homeless initiatives, and media networking events and social media campaigns. She holds a bachelor's degree in mass communication and psychology from Xavier University in New Orleans, Louisiana, and is currently pursuing a master's degree in writing and digital communication at Agnes Scott. Join me in welcoming Ms. Renee Matt. Thank you. Good morning. Is this good? Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to Jennifer Gunter and Kate Schoen for all of the work that they have done to organize this summit. I'm very excited to be here um, with you all today and with um, you two especially. Um, so yes, I'm Allison Bantimba. Um, I recently joined the National Center for Civil and Human Rights to develop um, plans for a reconciliation institute at the center. Um, our goal is to create a network of networks um, throughout Atlanta the, in the metro area um, to organize and amplify the efforts that are currently being done, are currently engaged in to address the symptoms of the legacy of racial terrorism and um, do a lot of work engaging the community to um, educate and address the uh, history of racial terrorism that has been very much repressed um, through our education system and elsewhere. Um, oh no. Okay. Um, so I am much better. Um, so I was brought to the center after starting the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition. Um, in my graduate work as a master's student at, um, in social work at Georgia State. Mm -hmm. And the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition is a group of individuals that are engaged in the Community Remembrance Project in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and our overall goal is to claim our memorial dedicated to the 36 victims of racial terror lynching in Fulton County. Um, from the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and we do, are doing that through soil collections um, to commemorate each victim, erecting historical markers. Um, we will be host, uh, facilitating racial justice essay contests in local public high schools around Atlanta, um, and then eventually claiming this monument. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it off. <coughs> So the, the Barclay Forum is at Emory University, and it began, the debate program at Emory began in 1837. It was one of the first extracurricular activities to exist when it was on the Oxford campus, which is about 40 minutes outside of Atlanta. When it moved to the Atlanta area campus, one of the first programs to be produced on that campus was also a debate team. 
So at the heart and soul of Emory University is the notion of debate. How do we bring students together in order to have contest contestation around ideas, and how do we help them become a part of the policymaking apparatus that occurs on our campus, but also in the greater Atlanta area? As you can probably imagine, most debate programs throughout the United States are those that are shrouded in income inequality, that are shrouded in a set of privileges that go along the lines of gender and sexuality, and that I have attempted to try to do some things around how do we take the resources, both from a financial perspective, but also from an intellectual perspective, and use those as a way to dismantle some of the systems of oppression that we have. And I wanted to sort of briefly read a quote by, uh, from this book that's called uh, The Third University by La Paperson that gives you an idea of some of the work that's sort of guiding what we're trying to do at Emory. And they argue, technologies are the master's tools, and that they will never just be that, any more than you are the master's tools. Figure out how technologies operate, use a wrench. Technologies can be disrupted and reorganized. Rather than thinking of ourselves as subjects of those technologies, think about how we are drones, explosives, taxified, operative parts of those technologies, and ideally how we may operate ourselves and others and turn the gears into decolonizing operations. I am interested in the ways of using a debate, dialogue, and deliberation as decolonizing technologies both on our campus, but also outside of our campus in the greater Atlanta area. I'm a product of the Atlanta Area Urban Debate League, which started in 1985 at Emory University, where then the director, Melissa Maxi Wade, decided that she was interested in figuring out how does she use the resources at Emory University in order to help develop debate programs in the inner city of Atlanta where I grew up. I was at Harper High School at that particular point in time, and it was my first introduction to debate where a college student came in and provided some training, helped us go to debate tournaments, and that, that was where I was on and going debating, as Malcolm X would have said. Uh, now, that is one of the programs that I oversee at Emory University in helping our college students to go and do, and do that same set of projects. But I'm actually interested in work that goes much deeper than that as well. And that there are a few other things that I'd like to talk about that we're doing that I, I think can be replicated in some other communities, but speaks to one of the sort of overall dynamics of what we're interested in is bringing people together to talk about and across their differences. Uh, one is that we started a program called the Emory Conversation Project, where we have about 30 students who are trained to facilitate conversations but, and they also are provided some resources to convene other students on the campus to come together and talk about those needling issues that we all talk about, but we tend to talk about with folks who look like us and think like us. All of us are talking in the state of Georgia about reproductive justice and the decline of opportunities to have abortion rights. But those tend to be talked about with folks who share our perspectives and our opinions on those things. There are conversations that are being had about voter suppression in our state and the recent gubernatorial elections, but those conversations tend to happen with folks who think like us and look like us. The Emory Conversation Project is interested in figuring out how do we train students to bring other students together from differing perspectives to have those particular conversations and in order for us to move together and move forward together. The other project that we're involved in is a book salon where we bring together staff members where we're in the division of campus life. Uh, student affairs, and we bring staff members together to read memoirs and to read a series of memoirs over the semester of people from varying perspectives. We have a total of eight of them, and that there are people who have lived very different lives. 
and some people attend all nine of them, some people attend one, some people attend some collection of those. I tend to, I am the facilitator of the salon, so I'm, I'm one of those, those ties that bind us together. But the other tie that binds us together is that we start each conversation by asking, where do we see ourselves in the life story of the person we just read? How do I come to understand how I make connections with someone who is transgender being someone who is not? How do I make connections and understand the life choices of someone who is white and poor living in Appalachia being someone who is not white nor living in Appalachia but grew up very poor? And how do we make connections across our differences? And so we bring staff members together as a way of drawing those connections and trying to find connections both in our stories, but also the stories of other people. The other event that other students are existing on the campus, and that what we've done is that we've provided them with some advisement, some resources in order to help them do a better job of getting their message out on a more consistent basis and a more professionalized basis. But the project that we're going to do starting next semester is that we're going to do a series of presidential debate commentaries uh, where those students will watch the presidential debates, I will watch it with them, and we will then have a conversation about how are black folks <laughs> reading this conversation that's happening at a national level about various sets of issues. And we're going to particularly talk about the issue that most people in this country may think black folks may not be interested in. So we're going to talk about the foreign policy components that have nothing to do with Africa. Because black people have opinions about things that are not necessarily black. And I would like those students to have a forum where they can articulate that opinion and articulate that perspective and learn that they can be public intellectuals and pontificate about all things that are worldly and all things that impact their lives. The other and last thing that I'll speak to uh, involves the work that the National Center for Civil and Human Rights is doing, is that we're interested in facilitating civic debates. And so recently, we had a collection of students from all around the country come in and have a, take a tour of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights and then they did a series of presentations around voter suppression and what are policies that we can implement in order to address those particular uh, sets of issues and concerns. And they did that in a public space in the center where other patrons were coming through and observing, listening to the conversations that they were having, and also having an opportunity to ask the students questions about the work that they were doing. Once again, how do we bring the public into the conversation and have our students engage with other folks about the ways in which we should be having conversations about race, class, sexuality, and what policies we need to have in order to remedy those particular sets of issues. I am someone who is very much on board with the way in which Ibram Kende, uh, who does a tremendous amount of anti-racism work in DC, talks about the question of racism that it's not just about the way in which we talk with each other, but it's about the way in which we create policies and practices, and that we need to train students, and we need to train ourselves how to engage in conversations about policies, practices, and procedures, and the way in which those produce a maldistribution of resources and opportunities along the lines of race. And until we have a language that's grounded in policy, I don't think that we're going to get very far. And so my effort at Emory University and my effort in the city of Decatur, which I'll pass the mic on to uh, my colleague uh, here, that I do a lot of work, that, that we do a lot of work together there, uh, is really around that particular question. How do we have better conversations about the way in which policies, practices, and procedures impact us along the lines of race? Thank you for being here and listening to me. I don't know why I agreed to um, follow Ed. <laughs> I should have learned my lesson a long time ago. <laughs> this is not our first rodeo together, so I hadn't, I don't even know what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> um, so good morning. Again, my name is Renee Madison, and I am the communications manager for the city of Decatur. Just to give you a little background about the city of Decatur, um, our city is 4.4 square miles with about 24,000 residents. We're a very dense city and growing. Um, 
we are a city that is pretty much affluent and um, one of the bigger conversations that's happening right now is affordable housing, lack of affordable housing, which I know that is a conversation around the country, and also our lack of diversity or people being concerned about us losing our diversity. Um, in 2015, the city started an initiative called the Better Together Community um, Initiative. And this initiative started with a resident who approached the city with allegations of racial profiling from our police. The city manager immediately knew that this was something that had to be addressed. But it spoke to some underlying issues that may have been bubbling up in our community. Um, we have a lot of community opportunities to participate in different um, planning processes, but we noticed that all of the people look the same that showed up to these processes. So why aren't other folks in our city not showing up? Why aren't the black folks showing up? Why aren't people of color showing up to give their input? So in 2015, we had a year-long process. And uh, with the Better Together process, around 800 residents provided or volunteered 1,300 hours in doing this process. And everyone came together to create the Better Together Community Action Plan around equity, inclusion, and engagement. During this planning process, we, um, there was a community conversation around differences. And it was a very impactful conversation because you had the chief of police and the resident who um, was experiencing racial profiling at the same table having these conversations. And you had other folks in the community who lived next door to each other had no idea who, didn't know their neighbors having these conversations. So a lot of things came out of this process. Neighborliness, um, having your voice to be heard, and just feeling welcome in the city. Um, so our action plan includes 600 action items with six focus areas. And Ed, if I miss something, please help me. Um, we have um, a focus area around community engagement, racially just policing, welcome and inclusive businesses, the use of public space, um, affordable housing, and affordable transportation. We are a small city, but there are things um, situated far enough from each other where folks who don't have cars or our seniors can't get to. And we pride ourselves in being a walkable city, but we also have to remember people that may not be able to get out and walk and bike. Um, and so the action plan also includes things not only for the city, but for the community, nonprofits, businesses, and other folks who engage in our city so that we are all doing this work together. Out of this plan came the uh, creation of the Better Together Advisory Board. And Ed is one of our co-chairs for that board. And the board's job is to make sure that they, we are holding people accountable for doing these things and make sure, making sure that we are looking at these action items. And I don't want to say check the box because I hate that. <laughs> um, because I want this to be more than checking the box. This is like a lifelong change and things that we are inherently doing. But they're making sure that we are looking at the things that um, these folks came up with because we want people to know, yes, we brought you to the table. Yes, we heard what you have to say, and it means a lot to us, so we are going to do that work. They are also responsible for being kind of the advisors to the city commission when things come up. Um, we have an obelisk in our downtown square, and as it has happened in other places, it became a very contentious issue. And so when the city was creating a statement around this obelisk and the removal of it, um, they look to the best, Better Together Advisory Board for the best way to make that statement to represent all people in our community. Um, oh, yeah, so we just implemented a Welcoming Business Award, and this is a way for us to kind of celebrate those businesses that go out of their way to be welcoming. And that includes um, being accessible to all folks in our community, um, just saying hello when you walk in the door, just having a really great experience when you're visiting these businesses. And it's very interesting because you'll hear people in our city, oh, we're, we are welcoming, we love everybody, but then you hear experiences of other people 
and you're like, wait a minute, we need to talk about this. And we had, we had raving reviews for one of our businesses, and then we had someone to go in to kind of chat with the owner and had a horrible experience. And it was like, it kind of threw our board for a loop because we were like, okay, these nominations were great, but that one experience kind of knocked them out. And so what our board is doing is we're working, coming up with a plan to assist businesses on ways that they can be more welcoming or how do we um, train, how do they train their employees to be more welcoming and inclusive because sometimes as we know, people do things and don't even realize it, but we have to be more intentional with our actions when we are moving forward and we are saying that we are inclusive and welcoming and all the other buzzwords. Um, we also, the board created an a asset map. Well, the, during the community action, um, the community process, a uh, community asset map was created. So we have over 200 businesses and nonprofits and um, organizations that do equity work. And so one thing that the board does is continue to update that map, but we convene these community partners. We check in with them to see what work they're doing, how can we assist them, how can we partner, how can we help them mobilize the work that they're doing, and making sure that we are staying in contact with them and we're helping, helping them push their message out and um, assisting them in any kind of way. Thank you all so much and one thing that I that was going over in my head was um, these are things that we can do here these are things that we can do in Jackson Mississippi or in uh, in Birmingham Alabama um, and also I was thinking uh, can can you guys talk a little bit about um, how sometimes what you're doing isn't working <clears throat> and then what do you do Um, so when we first formed our Better Together board, it was, we had people that were involved in the initial process and we had people that weren't. And so bringing all of those folks together um, was a task in itself because some people were um, familiar with the plan and then some people weren't, which gave us, let us know that we didn't even let the community know. We didn't, how do we educate the community on what this plan is? And that's something we are still working on. How do we educate people on what this plan is and why is it important to them? And so just throwing the, I'm not gonna say we threw the board together, but bringing the board together at the beginning was a task that I wouldn't say necessarily didn't work, but um, it's something that we, it took us a couple of years to work through that. And I think now that we have a good rhythm, um, and even with presenting this plan to our city commission, we had a couple of commissioners that were like, why do we need this? Because when you have people that think that they're already welcoming and they're already inclusive, they feel like there's no work to be done. We don't need this. And we had to continue to help people understand the importance of this. It's great to um, do, put something to, together and get awards for it, but the awards don't mean anything to other people. It's the work that we're doing and how are we being intentional to put, um, making this work happen. And so we still have, um, we're still struggling with getting people to understand it. And then even with affordable housing, that is, that is the biggest thing that uh, we are dealing with as far as our community because we have people, yeah, we want affordable housing, but not right here. We don't want it right here. Look somewhere else. And we just bought 77 acres of land. And during that planning process, we had a really big group to advocate for affordable housing, but we had a really big group that fought against it. And so, it makes me think about our plan and how we're educating folks and that that piece of the plan for us is not working because we can't get everybody on the same page and come up with um, kind of a middle ground. 
So we do have an affordable housing task force that's kind of working on that, and it'll be interesting to see what the community response is going to be out of that. And I hope I answered your question. So I'm, I'm a I'm a tinkerer or a hobbyist, if you will. I don't I don't need things to be perfect, and I just operate in a space where there are sort of I, I experiment, I access the experiment. I then make some adjustments and I do it again. And so there's there's constant failure that's sort of baked within the way in which we do things or I do things. And it, one of the struggles that I have is getting students to buy into that, that increasingly uh, we seem to be existing in a society where there is a need for perfection. And I think that that's probably not just with students, I actually find that with uh, older folks that, who I'm engaging with, where there's a need for something to be full scale in its complete form before we can move forward. And it, there's lots of anxiety that's built around projects when I show up. And I, this, this project that we did with uh, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, that there were lots of people on our campus who were saying, no, we need a year before we can plan this, that it takes us all, we gotta do marketing, we gotta do this, we gotta do that, we gotta make sure the proper people are invited to show up to this particular event. And as I know, we are, we are, this is a pilot. We are going to do this, and then we will figure out how to have the second version of it that meets whatever the demands are that you need, and just moving forward, that there are a lot, and, and I'm also someone who believes in forgiveness instead of permission. Uh, I am constantly going and doing things and saying, oh, I, I, I didn't know that we had that policy. I'm sorry about that. And, that, and, and so being, being willing to fail and uh, being willing to have your knuckles rattled a little bit because you did something that was off kilter, I think is one of the ways in which I go about dealing with that sort of issue. Um, so yeah, my work is a continual learning process. Um, I am very excited that I have the opportunity to design something from the ground up, but it means that there is a lot of trial and error and failure and um, starting over. So even listening to the bio that I sent in a month or so ago, even just the title of what I'm doing at the center is completely different. Um, and the changes really stem from um, working in a group with people that have a very clear idea of what we want to do, and then when we bring it out to the community, the community's like, no, not really interested in that. And it um, really brings home the fact that I can't start any work until I have the community on board. Um, and so it is this trial and error and seeing the response, but taking the um, time to talk to the impacted communities um, more so than the affluent people that are interested in um, helping out um, because both parties have two uh, different ideas of what progress looks like. Um, and so kind of meshing those two um, perspectives and figuring out how we can work together in a process of um, reconciliation and that word. Um, if you were at Dawnland last night um, and got to hear Esther Ann speaking about um, how reconciliation is a bit of a problematic word, it, that is something that I've definitely experienced um, through this process because the truth telling process needs to come first and we all have very different um, perceptions of what the truth of our history is and there is um, a lot of work that has to go into it and my social worker side um, always wants to tend to the trauma that comes up from addressing these truths and it is a process that takes much longer than I would normally I would like to hope it would but um, it's a process that I have to be patient with and um, take the time to get as many people involved and on board as I can. So. Thank you so much. And so I agree on the word reconciliation. I inherited um, the name of this organization and 
it's an ongoing, like, should we change the name? Uh, what, what would say it better? Uh, how, how wrong is this? Uh, how do you reconcile something that has never been conciled? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's an ongoing process. Um, but right now we want to take some questions. Uh, who might have questions for these wonderful people? Allison, um, you mentioned uh, the monument coming to Atlanta uh, from EGI. Um, could you talk a little bit about that process, what you've got to go through, how you've gotten it to this point, where you are with it, and when do you expect it to be put in place? Um, yeah, so it is a much longer process than the initial um, Back in 2018, after going to the um, opening of the museum and the monument, um, I just emailed them and said, oh, I'm interested in claiming this monument and thinking that it would be a, a pretty easy process. Um, and it is intentionally designed to not be an easy process. Um, we have to, we created this coalition um, and each community has different models of what their coalition looks like, but in Fulton County, um, it's mainly individuals who um, are just interested in this work. Uh, the Community Remembrance Project itself, which is the project that culminates in the claiming of the monument, um, is made up of three separate projects. Um, so the first one that we uh, engaged in was the Soil Collection Project, um, and each coalition has to submit a proposal back to EJI, and um, once the proposal is approved, you become an official partner of EJI, um, and they do, they assist completely and wholeheartedly throughout the process. So we conducted um, 35 uh, soil collections at sites that are the exact location, the best approximation of the location of a lynching or a site that is symbolic to the person or the family members of the people of the person who was lynched um, and Fulton County is unfortunately unique in that we have the highest number of lynchings in Georgia and one of the highest in the country um, when we started it was 35 an additional um, name has been added to our list mr. Dennis Hubert um, in the past couple months, so we will be doing a soil collection for him in the spring, so if you're in Atlanta. Um, but the second project is um, erecting the historical markers, um, and that is in conjunction with hosting or facilitating racial uh, justice essay contests at local public high schools. Um, and one of the main focuses of all these projects outside of memorializing these individuals who didn't receive due process, who um, have stories have been very much hidden and forgotten, um, is the community engagement around this legacy of racial terrorism and identifying how it distinctly connects to our current issues uh, in society with mass incarceration, um, racialized housing practices, inequity in education, uh, voter suppression, and all of the others. Um, but the idea of the monument, and, and I think EJI had initially said that monuments would be able to be claimed by 2019, and we are winding down in 2019, and they still have not released the guidelines for actually claiming the monument itself. And my speculation is that it is very intentional because the monument ends up just being a tangible representation of the change that happens in the community. And change can't happen in the one year that they have erected this um, memorial in Montgomery and now. So we are realizing that it's going to take a long time to engage the entirety of the community, um, especially with a county like Fulton County where you have Alpharetta and Palmetto and downtown Atlanta. Um, so it's just a very unique and diverse area. Um, and so yeah, we're just kind of chug, uh, chugging along, engaging people, doing as much education as we can, um, and continuing to shine light on these stories of racial terror lynching um, that happened in our backyard, really. Hi. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, so, so glad to be here. Uh, I'm from Greenville, uh, South Carolina, Greenville County, and we also have started uh, the, the uh, initiative and started out with uh, Say His Name, which was a big public forum to kind of announce it. And I'll be honest, we've kind of juggled back and forth with the success of it. Over 400 people came. Um, but uh, I, I guess my, my question is, uh, we have four uh, recognized individuals in Greenville County uh, lynching and their descendants that are there. And look at the legacy, like you said, how does the lynching of uh, uh, George Green and his incident relate to uh, gentrification? So we are linking those in the community. But my biggest question, because you're all talking about getting a community buy-in, is the young people. That's kind of where my, my, my passion is, is that that's where we really need to be working with. And so in the essay, going to the public schools, this may be a, have to be a private conversation, I know. But what are you doing there? How is that accepted in the public schools? Uh, how are you moving forward in with, with young people uh, in, in this process? Uh, that, that's kind of my question. Is like, where are y'all at? Where's the, the essay? I know it goes to public schools or private schools. How is that coming to be? What's the acceptance in the community? When you deal with adults, one thing, but when you deal with young people and you have your parents and you have a school board and everybody kind of around going, well, you know, don't want to rock any waves. So, what are y'all doing with that? Um, well, I can answer briefly, but then I might pass it on to you because you are doing your work with young people all, all the time. But um, we, so we are just um, in the very beginning stages of our historical marker project, so we haven't um, started any of the racial justice essay contests yet. Um, with the contest itself, the uh, winners of the contest do get a um, scholarship from EJI, and so that does help uh, the buy-in a little bit. Um, but we have been struggling with getting young people involved in this because it's not an exciting topic. Um, there is way too many exciting things happening in Atlanta for young people that um, it's difficult to get young people to come and talk about lynchings um, 50 years or 60 years before they were uh, born. But um, one thing that I have noticed, um, I go to, the Legacy Museum often, um, and I've noticed all the school groups that are coming through there and listening to the young people um, just talking about what they're learning in the museum is inspiring in itself because um, I've been asked a, a lot of what, what age should we start telling kids about this um, history and what age should we um, in, engage them in this work. Um, and I, my belief is that as young as you can, um, if you are open to holding your child throughout the museum, please bring them um, because it is so much more difficult to have to relearn history and, and grapple with that. And so when I talk about reconciliation, it's not this great kumbaya racial reconciliation, we're all gonna get along, it's reconciling with the truth of our history. And when we are, taught that slavery didn't just end and we're taught that um, <coughs> the civil rights movement wasn't this brief experience and now we have civil rights and we have Obama and so everything must be good. Um, it's very difficult, but if you learn that at a young age, kids are very resilient and they can learn a difficult thing and contextualize it how they need to and move forward, but um, it's important that young people do learn this, but um, getting them engaged is what I can pass this off to, to you about. You, have you approached school boards allowing this essay in the school, in, in, the, in the district, or? Um, so I've been in some brief conversations, like preliminary conversations with um, some coordinators, like in Atlanta Public Schools, I think the social studies coordinator um, I've spoken to, and a lot of teachers, um, especially with the release of uh, True Justice, uh, the documentary on HBO, um, Coonhart Films Foundation has created an entire curriculum that were, is um, based on True Justice and the work that Brian Stevenson and the uh, like, uh, Equal Justice Initiative are doing. Um, and it's free and accessible to all educators. It's, if you just go on coonhartfilmsfoundation.org, I believe, it's all there. And um, 
So I, I've come in contact with a lot of educators who are interested and um, excited about teaching this curriculum and, and making their students aware of this. Um, so we are definitely in a, in a time that is polarizing and difficult and um, very stressful, but it, it has opened up a window of opportunity be, and people are hungry, I believe, to um, bring this information to students. So I, I think of community as a series of conversations. <laughs> and if we want to change a community, we need to change who's participating in the conversation and what we're talking about. And I have to remind myself of this when working with students, whether or not I'm talking about college age students or folks who are a little younger, that far too often we show up having decided what the program is, what the project is, without incorporating them into the conversation about what we're doing and even planning how it's going to be done. And so harkening back to the, one of the initial questions around failure, one of the series of failures that I constantly have in sitting up in the middle of the night, and at no point in time have I talked to the people who I expect to participate. So there needs to be a conversation with students around what they want, what their goals are, and even conversations with parents. And I think that a lot of times that we go forward and move forward with particular objectives <coughs> and without having conversations with students in the planning component of what we're doing. A lot of our projects now, they are deciding, we come and say, here are the resources we have, here are the structures that we're thinking about, what should we be talking about, how should this be implemented, who are the other folks who should be involved, and how does this look? And we have far more success when there's ownership that's taken on the part of some students with a project than when we show up as the owners and only accept, expect them to be participants. And this year, uh, we started the South Carolina Youth Collective, um, focusing on teens. And one of the components is a summer fellows program that's open to this year all South Carolina high school students. Um, and part of the application process is they have to propose a project for their own community because I don't live in those communities. I don't know what they are. Um, and you'd be pleasantly surprised by how aware they are about what their communities need. Um, and so I absolutely agree. So we have time for one more question, and I know that you want to ask a whole lot of questions, but one of the uh, one of the key takeaways from the survey last year was that you also want more time to talk to each other. So we're going to take one more question here, and then you'll have 30 minutes to just talk to each other before the next program starts. Okay? All right. So one more question. I have a question on affordable housing. Um, you said that you just purchased 77 acres, and I'm trying to understand, um, from our perspective, affordable housing is fantastic. It's one of our goals. At the same time, mixed income neighborhoods are more of a goal, because isolating the poor is notoriously, it notoriously leads to all types of social ills. And so we're trying to figure out why it is that mixed income neighborhoods are not as much of a goal as they have been in the past, where we can have empathy for one another at various socioeconomic levels. So thank you for asking that question. Um, one of the things that our affordable, ha t uh, t uh, affordable housing task force is working on is defining the word affordable, right? Um, because when we say affordable, we automatically think low income. And some of the comments that have already been addressed is that we have a housing authority, which isn't even, is not all low income either. So educating people to let them know that this is not an area where only low income people stay. There are some people that pay uh, market rent in these in these spaces. So just thinking about being intentional with the words that we use and how the words that we use are seen globally and how do we change those narratives. Um, the housing that we're looking at for 
parts of this land that we bought is mixed income and it may be worth for worth us saying that instead of saying affordable because we spent a whole maybe two weeks trying to define do we say affordable housing or attainable housing and who what's the AMI, the um, area of medium income that we are looking at. And so it, it made the process a lot longer, but it's, it's worth looking at all of those things. And again, being intentional with what we are really trying to do and what are we really trying to accomplish and not using words that people just know, but being able to shift those narratives. Your, your, your question got me thinking about how race and class are ultimately a Gordian knot that's impossible to disconnect. That one of the reasons why we tend to not want to talk about things like mixed income or even affordable housing is that there's a patina of race that informs the way in which we think about those particular sets of issues. And there's a history of redlining, there's a history of segregation, in all many of our cities in the South, even in the North, but the way in which we process and think about these contemporary issues about housing, that we can't extract that from those, that history and even contemporary ways in which we think about race and what models of integration and what models of inclusion look like to empower people as a part of that decision-making process. And so I, I it, it's, it's far more complicated, and then I think we need to be asking more questions and even a different set of questions along the lines of race in order to get to some of the answers that we're, think, that we're asking ourselves when thinking about housing. And I'm not too sure how many of those questions become part of the way in which we're deliberating about that. Thank you all so much. Can you help me give a big round of applause to our friends from Atlanta? <laughs> So I uh, just want to let you know that we could not do this without um, the help of our co-sponsors. Um, they are wonderful and very generous to us. So first, Children's Trust of South Carolina. <laughs> the Center for Civil Rights History and Research, the I. De Quincy Newman Center. Uh, we are in partnership with the South Carolina Human Affairs Commission. Um, and we're just grateful to all of you and um, if if you can, please say hello to the uh, pastors and ministers in the room because we've also recently partnered with the, South, the Episcopal Diocese of Upper South Carolina. So, um, so you have a 30 minute break. Your name tag actually gets you admission to the galleries and a discount in the gift shop. Thought I'd throw that in. Uh, <laughs> and uh, next we will have an emotional wellness workshop in this room because this work is hard. And so uh, we'll meet you back here at 11.30 with um, Dr. Napoleon Wells. Thank you, guys.